फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ Okay, hi everybody. Uh, happy Diwali, and I guess we'll go ahead and get started with our session for today. Um, today's session is going to be about biceps labral junction and other posterior labral lesions or other labral lesions in the slap tears. We went through um, the anatomy in the first session. The second session was about the anterior instability related issues, and today's session is going to focus on the biceps labral junction as well as the remainder of the labrum. <clears throat> So before we get started, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. So let me do that. Okay. Um, now what I'm going to start out with again, like we did last time, and I think this is helpful, is go through the relevant MR anatomy that we'll be looking at today. Uh, to start with, just to remind you and give you a quick recap on the sequences that we look at, um, there are essentially a few different types of sequences to look at. We look at these images that are called fat suppressed images. These are the dark images. This is where fat is dark and fluid is bright. So you can see intraarticular fluid is bright. Fat is dark here within the bone. So the marrow fat is dark and the subcutaneous fat is dark. Um, these are proton density images where you have a little bit of gray for bright and edematous areas and the fat remains bright, but it shows you the anatomy really, really well. Um, in terms of the planes, we do three planes. So we have the coronal plane, which is, self-explanatory, the axial plane, which is bread sliced from up to down like this, right? And then we have the sagittal plane where we essentially come from medial to lateral. So these are the images that we will normally get. In today's session on the biceps labral junction, there are a few pieces of anatomy that I want to go through. So as we think about this, we think about the areas of the rotator interval. So when you look at the sagittal images here, we can see this is the supraspinatus. So this is the Y of the scapula. The supraspinatus is sitting above the spine. This is the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. Now, as we scroll laterally, uh, you can see the tendons coming together and coming and attaching on the humeral head. The space, obviously, that is between the supraspinatus and the subscapularis here, this is the rotator interval. And within the rotator interval runs the long head of the biceps in its intraarticular portion. So this is this little flattened structure here that you'll see, and we'll see some clearer images of it. Um, the structure that runs over it here is the coracohumeral ligament and the structure running sort of anterior to it here is the superior glenohumeral ligament. And we'll see other images which demonstrate this a little bit better. <clears throat> On the coronal images, as you scroll, you can see here, this is essentially the biceps tendon. So you can see the biceps tendon here and you can see how it comes across and attaches to the superior labrum. This here is the superior labrum itself. So this is an important structure to look at. The superior labrum on these coronal images is, um, uh, is an important structure to look at. So this was your superior labrum, and that's an area that you want to look at. It should have this black signal um, like this has over here. Once we see the superior labrum, we want to look at the posterior and anterior labrum. So remember here, as you look up here, this is going to be your anterior superior labrum. The structure that runs just in front of the anterior superior labrum here is the middle glenohumeral ligament. So this is your anterior superior labrum. This is your middle glenohumeral ligament that runs deep to the scapula. And then this, as you go lower down, becomes your anterior inferior labrum. And similarly, this at the back here, this triangle is your posterior labrum and your posterior superior labrum. Now, one thing that I'm going to try and drive home today is that looking at labral lesions is not easy. It takes time, it takes practice, and it takes a lot of uh, focus to look at it. There's a lot of people who have touted the use of MR arthrograms. Personally, I don't use MR arthrograms. I was never trained to use them at the institution I trained at. And we have done reasonably well, I would say extremely well in terms of identifying labral lesions. And we have a good degree of satisfaction from our orthopedic surgeons when we report them without arthrograms. So we've never really done them. So it's not something I can speak to, speak of with uh, a lot of confidence. So I won't be talking about arthrograms in this situation. Um, so, <clears throat> So this is sort of the anatomy that I wanted to familiarize with you. Uh, now what we'll do is we'll go and talk about the biceps labral junction. So this is sort of uh, the section that we'll talk about the structures of the biceps labral junction. So we'll talk about the long head of the biceps, its vertical portion, the pulley, the horizontal portion, and the anchor. Then we'll talk about the rotator interval and the structures within it, which are the superior subscapularis, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the coracohumeral ligament, the biceps, and the anterior supraspinatus, 
and then we'll talk about the superior labrum, its labral variants, and we'll talk about the slap lesions. So most of you are familiar with the anatomy of the long head of the biceps in particular. It runs vertically in the bicepital groove as it reaches the top of the groove and above the level of the scapular attachment, uh, the, sorry, the subscapularis attachment, it traverses across through the rotator interval to go to its natural attachment at the uh, sublime tubercle of the glenoid, so superiorly on the glenoid labrum. Okay, um, It's often termed as a pain generator and there's a bunch of people who just resect it thinking it's not got any use to it. Now, when we look at this on the axial images, the vertical portion of the biceps is something we can see here on the axial images. Um, this is sort of more of the intra-articular portion that we see it. The bicipital groove communicates with the glenohumeral joint. So if you see fluid in the bicipital groove, it doesn't mean that somebody has bicipital synovitis. We see intra-articular fluid extending along the biceps tendon sheath all the time. If you see isolated large volume biceps tendon sheath fluid, that's when you're going to start to think of somebody having a bicipital um, you know, synovitis or some sort of an inflammatory process within the bicipital tendon itself. Uh, the bicipital tendon, as you know, is held in place. And I'm going to show you here again on this. It's held in place in the bicipital groove by the transverse ligament, which is essentially a condensation of the deep fibers of the subscapularis. So here you can see there are fibers of the subscapularis that end at the um, medial uh, lip of the bicipital groove. And there are a few fibers that go across. And these fibers that go across will form the transverse ligament. So here's our first case. Now you have seen over here, when we look at these sagittal images, you can see that here is the long head of the biceps right here, just between supraspinatus, the coracohumeral ligament and the biceps tendon is right here. And you can see in this case that instead of a dark black structure, we're just seeing this little gray nubbin of structure. When we look at the axial images, which is essentially these images here, you would expect to see this biceps along with uh, you know, as you go down to the myotendinous junction here, but in this case, you don't see any biceps and you see the muscle is all balled up down here. And this is a proximal bicep, long head biceps tendon rupture. Here is another example of something that can go wrong with the biceps. You see isolated fluid along the biceps tendon sheath. And we notice this tiny little dark object here, which actually ended up being a small focus of calcific periarthritis. Now one has to be careful when we see little foci of calcification within the biceps tendon sheath, because as I mentioned earlier, it communicates with the joint. And so if you have osteoarthritis, you can have some of those intra-articular bodies trickling down and you can see that debris along the biceps tendon sheath. And that's probably something we see more often while doing ultrasound than while doing MRI. But you can see calcifications, you can see small little intra-articular bodies within the biceps tendon sheath. And you've got to be careful in terms of determining whether it's calcific periarthritis or just intra-articular debris that's extending in there. Here's another example of someone who's got a biceps uh, calcific periarthritis. And in this case, and this is not very infrequent that we see occasionally because these things happen at enthesial attachments, you can see uh, calcific periarthritis also extending into bone. So this is sort of an unusual example of that. Now, as we think about the biceps, as it goes vertically up, it crosses and becomes horizontal. And there's a pulley obviously that causes it to do that or that it slides through. And that pulley is essentially formed by the coracohumeral ligament and the uh, and sort of the uh, um, the uh, superior glenohumeral ligament complex. And you you have a structure there that sort of wraps around. So if we think about this, this is the long head of the biceps traversing across. Here we have the superior glenohumeral ligament that encases it, um, and then along with it you have uh, the coracohumeral ligament superiorly and the superior glenohumeral ligament that runs sort of anterior and inferior to it. If we look at a sagittal image, you'll see this is the subscapularis, this is the long head of the biceps, this is the supraspinatus. The coracohumeral ligament will go over and the superior glenohumeral ligament will run sort of anterior to it. So just to give you a sense, here's the MR equivalent of it at the rotator interval. This is the supraspinatus. This is the coracohumeral ligament. This structure here is the superior glenohumeral ligament. This is the subscapularis and this is the long head of the biceps essentially looking just like this. Now, if we think about these sagittal images, you can see here is a patient who you can see the supraspinatus, long head biceps, coracohumeral, superior glenohumeral, and subscap. And in this case, which is a little bit different, you can see here that this superior glenohumeral ligament is actually significantly more thickened than the one over here. 
this little fact that's here is not seen here. And this is what you would potentially see in cases with early stage inflammatory arthropathy or with early stage, more likely adhesive capsulitis. Here you can see how this biceps tendon has got this small ovoid appearance. Here you can see a slightly thicker biceps with a little bit of intrasubstance signal indicating some intraarticular biceps degeneration. And then this is the case that we saw earlier where you actually just see that the biceps is missing. So the missing biceps over here indicates that there's a long head biceps rupture. Um, here's an image of the normal biceps. This is within the bicipital groove, this structure here as the subscapularis comes off. And then here you can see it in the intraarticular and sort of as it crosses the pulley with the coracohumeral ligament above the superior glenohumeral ligament anteriorly. Here's a patient where you can see gross medial migration. So you have a subscapularis tear and the biceps has subluxed medially. Okay, so that is a complete uh, biceps tendon uh, medial subluxation. And here where you'd expect to see the biceps in this part of the rotator interval, you see it all the way down here or you don't see it at all because it's subluxed medially. Here's another example of someone where you can see this biceps is here, but it's slightly more medial than expected. And here you'd expect to see the biceps tendon somewhere around here, but you see it's down here. So it's subluxed slightly in this case. And this is a comparative example. So this is the normal biceps. This is the early medial subluxation. And this is the complete medial dislocation of the biceps. And similarly here, you can see the normal biceps tendon here with the coracohumeral ligament. Here you can see this biceps is flattened and thinned and there's a lot more amount of rotator interval scarring. Here you can see that you'd expect to see the biceps sitting up here, but it's come down here. So there's a little bit of subluxation of the biceps. And in this case, you can see that the biceps is actually uh, dislocated or absent and therefore you don't see it at all. Now, um, as you move from that biceps, we sort of start to think about the posterior superior labrum and glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. And in these situations, you know, one, I'm going to actually skip this because the slide shouldn't have come here as well. But no, we'll just go through. Sorry. So here, what we, what one would typically see once you looked at your biceps, you come back, you start to look at the labrum, and what you can see in this case is you can see that there's tendinosis within the supraspinatus. This is usually when you look on the sagittal images more involving the posterior supra and the anterior infraspinatus in terms of its location. Uh, we can see that the anterior capsule in front of the labrum is thickened here. And we can see here that there's posterior bony remodeling of this glenoid in something like a Bennett lesion. And here this large discrete labral tear posteriorly, as well as you see thickening of the inferior glenohumeral ligament posteriorly here. So all of these things, and here you can see there's inferior capsular thickening. So all of these things together, the posterior labral tear, the remodeling of the posterior glenoid, the inferior capsular thickening, and the tendinosis involving the posterior supra and anterior infraspinatus together give you a sense of somebody having internal derangement, posterior internal rotation deficit, or sorry, internal uh, impingement. The thinking behind this to some extent and it varies all the time, was that when you perform continuous abductive movements, especially in throwers and throwing movements, you end up having scarring of the inferior capsule. When you scar the inferior capsule and then you try to throw again, normally the humeral head should descend, but because they have that scarred inferior capsule, the humeral head ascends up. As it ascends up, it will start to impinge up and posteriorly, so it impinges on the posterior cuff. So this posterior supra and the anterior infraspinatus. It also impinges on the posterior superior labrum. So you develop posterior superior labral tears. And then it gradually starts to remodel the posterior glenoid itself. Now, as all this is happening and these posterior structures are getting loaded, they're also going to push the humeral head forwards. And when they push the humeral head forward, the only person sitting there is the biceps tendon. And then that biceps tendon starts to get overloaded you start to get flattening and wear of that biceps tendon. You start to see micro instability of that tendon. And that tendon then starts to sublux a little craniocaudally and produces tears through the anterior su supraspinatus or the superior subscapularis, sort of like a little razor knife doing that. So here's an example again of posterior or internal impingement. Here you can see the tendinosis in the supraspinatus, the inferior capsular thickening posteriorly here. Uh, the very diminutive and worn out posterior labrum. And you can see that the tendinosis is more involving the posterior supra and the anterior infraspinatus.
So what ends up happening? There's posterior inferior capsular scarring. This leads to posterior superior impingement of the labrum and cuff. Then you have attempted anterior migration of the humeral head, which is restrained by the long head of the biceps, which leads to thinning and wear of the long head of the biceps, which gives it a long a sort of knife edge appearance. This may flatten and remodel the underlying humeral head, in which case you get bone marrow edema in the humeral head as the biceps traverses. And that's something that we call a chondral print. And then this sort of starts to slice into the anterior supraspinatus and the upper subscapularis and starts to produce tears. So here's an example. You can see this biceps tendon that's flattened here, just sort of producing this little bony remodeling uh, in this anterior superior humeral head. And this is this chondral print type appearance that we see with that. Here's an example of somebody who's had a posterior dislocation. So as you come posteriorly, you can see the bone marrow edema. As you keep coming more anteriorly, you can see the reverse Hillsax lesion here with the extensive bone marrow edema. And then you can start to see this sizable posterior labral tear, as you can see this defect here where the labrum has peeled off the posterior glenoid. Um, so moving from that posterior labral stuff to the rotator interval, uh, we've already talked about the structures of the rotator interval, but what I wanted to show you here was somebody with a normal rotator interval, the ligament, and here you can see it's much thickened in somebody who would have something like a, an adhesive capsulitis. Here again, an example of a normal biceps, coracohumeral, so coracoid process tip here, coracohumeral ligament, superior glenohumeral ligament, and in a patient with calcific periarthritis, I mean with uh, inflammatory, uh, sorry, adhesive capsulitis, you can see extensive edema and thickening in that rotator interval area. So contrast this way, you can see this fat really nicely, and this way you just see all this edema blob and, and soft tissue scarring over there. Some other things we can see in the rotator interval, sometimes you can see a little intraarticular body. So this is a sort of large intraarticular body in the interval. Um, moving from the rotator interval, I think we start to look at the anterior superior labrum. And here, what one thing we've learned is both with the anterior superior and the posterior superior labrum, there are a lot of variants. So a lot of things we end up calling tears that are clefts and clefts that are tears. And therefore, it's becoming more and more important for us to have clinical information or to look at other signs to tell us whether this could really be a tear or this is just a cleft. So two big things to remember in the anterior labrum, one is the sublabral foramen and the second is the Buford complex. The sublabral foramen is a small defect in the anterior superior labrum, normally in the anterior superior quadrant. And the sub Buford complex is where you have an absent anterior superior labrum. So you see there's no labrum in this portion, but you have a thickened uh, super, superior and middle glenhumeral ligament. So here is an example on axial images. Notice this structure here. This is the anterior labrum, this dark triangle that we can see over here. As you go one slice down, you can see how this dark triangle has separated out and there's a small little gap between these two structures. So if I go up here on this image, you can see this triangular structure. Here you can see these two structures have separated out. I see that. So you can see this structure has separated out at this point. Okay. Um, okay. So that, and now you go one slice down and again, you can see it's a nice triangle. So nice triangle here, right? We go one step up and uh, you lose that nice triangle. It's got a little cleft and you come one step up and it's gone. So that's a very typical sublabral foramen. Okay. The other variant that you're going to get is normally, if you remember when I showed you, you would see a triangular labrum here on this coronal image like this, right? And in this case, what seems to have happened is that triangular structure is not there. You can also normally would expect to see a triangular structure here, which is the sort of, uh, sorry, uh, structure here, which would be the anterior superior labrum. And that's also missing, but you see this thickened middle glenohumeral ligament here. Um, and, and, and when you see that essentially, um, that is an absent anterior superior labrum and a thickened middle hemorrhoid ligament, which you would see in somebody with a Buford complex. So what are the variations on the biceps labral complex? Theoretically, you can have the biceps tendon with the labrum and the articular cartilage. Sometimes you can have this sort of hanging off here. It is a normal thing. So you see articular cartilage in between, you see the labrum and you see this hanging off. And this is what we call a type two biceps labral sulcus. Uh, 
Sometimes the labrum will be much bigger and hanging off even more, in which case you get something that is called a meniscoid labrum. So these are just variations on the biceps labral complex. Um, this would give you an appearance. This is the biceps tendon coming in here from this. And then this is sort of going to be a triangular labrum sitting in this area. And these two structures just blending into each other, producing the biceps labral complex. And here you can see this articular cartilage. This is the articular cartilage line very nicely. So you can see this articular cartilage and the articular cartilage is running all the way to the top. And you see this very prominent labral cleft here, which would be a type two uh, biceps. And then here, when you see it a little bit bigger, then you can see this is almost like a meniscoid labrum. So these would not be labral tears primarily because we're seeing articular cartilage running deep to them. And if it's a labral tear, Typically, you should not have articular cartilage running. And this is a controversial point, but this is one of the things that people look at. Other things that people look at is normally when you see a cleft, a cleft goes in this direction. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, a cleft would go in this direction, whereas a tear tends to go in more like this direction or a more vertical direction. Okay. But again, that's just something that we occasionally notice. So what are the variety of slap lesions that we get? Uh, we get a slap one lesion, which is a fraying at the biceps labral junction, a slap two lesion, which is a tear that remains attached to the biceps, a slap three, which is detached from the glenoid and labrum with a bucket handle component, a slap four, which is attached to the biceps, a slap five, which is just fraying before the labrum, and a slap six is a labral tear, which has taken off a bit of cartilage. So if you were to think of it as a variation of a glad lesion. So here is a normal biceps labral junction as labeled for you, the long head of the biceps. You can see many minimal degeneration of the labrum, glenoid cartilage, humeral cartilage, and the triangular labrum really nicely. And you compare to, excuse me, this patient with a labral tear. And here you can see this area of intrasubstance degeneration, this bright spot within this labrum. And that is essentially intrasubstance degeneration of the labrum in what would be typically a type one slap lesion. Um, this is another example where you can see that there's degeneration at the biceps labral junction. And along with it, you have development of intraosseous cystic change in the superior glenoid. Here you have somebody with a more discrete slap two lesion. So when you look over here, if you compare it, you can see here this labrum should have come off and you can see the labrum has come off. You can see that the cartilage sort of stops at this point. So the labral cleft is extending above the level of the cartilage. And therefore, this is a slap tear, um, which would be a slap, uh, a slap two lesion. Okay. So just to give you the, the, the comparisons here, you have this patient who is a meniscoid labrum. You can see that the articular cartilage is going all the way to the top here. You can follow this articular cartilage all the way to the top here. This gray zone here is the articular cartilage, this stuff here. Okay. Um, and on this patient, um, oops, sorry. Uh, right. And let's look at this one here where you can see the cartilage is stopping right here at this point. You see this gray cartilage stopping right here. And you can see that in this bare area, which is where there's a tear that's extending into this area. Oops. Um, You can see this tear extending into the bare area here, which is essentially the tear. So this is how you would differentiate between a meniscoid labrum and a labral tear. Again, with all of these, we find we sort of also go a lot with whether there are strong labral signs or not. I think the excitement to repair slap lesions uh, from a few years ago has reduced, especially if they are small slap lesions. Um, Here's another example of a slap lesion anteriorly. So this is the anterior portion, anterior labral tear here. And here's one of the arthrogram images where I have where you can see fluid signal tracking under the superior labrum demonstrating that slap lesion. A slap three lesion is one where the biceps and the, the labrum sort of becomes a bucket handle and comes off. And here you can see that there is a, a small, um, sorry. Here you can see where there is uh, the biceps coming up here at the top. And you can see this fluid signal and this piece of triangular labrum that has separated off 
that has separated off from the biceps as well as from the labrum. Let me just play this for you. So you can see here how it's separated off. This is the slap lesion. So we'll go follow it from the top. You can see that entire slap lesion anteriorly and posteriorly. So this superior labral tear, and this would be typical for a bucket handle type slap three lesion. A slap four lesion here is one where you'd be considering that it's come off, but it's still dangling off the biceps. And you can see there's a remained attachment here at the biceps as this sort of dangles off, um, off this edge over here. So more typical slap four type lesion. Um, I, don't, I don't normally report these. I just normally say that there's a tear from here to here. I don't usually go into the depth of whether it's which type of slap lesion it is. Here's a case of some subtle undersurface fraying along the biceps. Uh, in sort of what would be a slap five lesion. And just to give you a sense, here is a uh, normal sort of maybe a little bit of undersurface fraying. And here's probably more significant undersurface fraying along this biceps labral junction. So just to give you an idea of the spectrum of all the lesions that we would see, this is your meniscoid labrum with the articular cartilage running all the way to the top. This is your intrasubstance globular degenerative change, which is like a biceps two, uh, a, uh, a uh, slap one lesion. Here is more of what would be a typical slap two lesion. Um, sorry, uh, here. Um, here you can see, um, you know, the, the one with the piece of the labrum off. Here you can see the labrum still remains attached to the biceps. Um, and then finally, uh, here you have one where you have undersurface fraying of the, of the biceps tendon itself. So as you can see, the, it's a very, it's a very small structures that we're trying to see. You really need to have good high resolution imaging. And you really should have seen many of these labrum time and time again before you get comfortable with calling uh, different abnormalities within them. So what I've tried to do in essentially the last uh, half an hour or so is go through a summary of what the structures of the biceps labral junction are. Uh, we talked about the biceps. We looked at its vertical and horizontal portions. We looked at the pulley um, and where it is and what the structures are there. We looked, looked at the horizontal portion as well as the anchor. We looked at the rotator interval, the structures within the rotator interval and uh, early signs of adhesive capsulitis. And uh, we also looked at the superior labrum for its labral variants, as well as the slap lesions. Uh, we also looked at patients who had internal impingement, and we looked at posterior superior labral lesions, uh, and we looked at cases that had posterior dislocation. So this is what I've tried to do in the last half an hour, give you an overview of the anatomy, and then show you some of the, some of the findings that we see. What I'd like to do is take a moment right now to see if anybody has any questions. And then what I'll do is try and go over a few cases that would help us to sort of reinforce some of the things we are looking at. So are there any questions at this stage? Okay, so we have 19 participants and not really any questions at this stage. Oh wait, there is one, let's see what we have. Okay, so superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. Great question. So let's look at this here. So here are some structures. So, so here's just to give you a sense of where we're at. Um, as we look at these axial images, as we come more towards the uh, midline of the shoulder. So three. I'm going to keep three sequences open. Okay, and what we're going to try and do over here is. Uh, Let us see all three structures together. I'm going to minimize this thing. Great. And I'm going to close this chat. So here is the axial images. These are the coronal images. And these are the sagittal images. All right. So if we start with the superior glenohumeral ligament, the superior glenohumeral ligament is at the top here. It goes from the glenoid to, needless to say, the humerus. Um, it's usually high up here. It's the one that's probably harder to see. It's this small structure that we get over here high up. And when we start to see the axis, the sagittal images, it's this structure that's sitting just in front of the bicep. So this is sort of where I would say is the superior glenohumeral ligament. And then you're going to try and identify the structure. It's probably of the three, one of the harder ones to identify and to trace in its entirety. The second structure that we're looking at is as you come from above. So this is the superior labrum sections. You come lower down. 
and you can see a structure that is just sitting anterior. So this here is the triangle of the labrum. And just in front of the labrum, you see an additional structure. That additional structure is the middle glenohumeral ligament. And you will know it because the moment you hit the section where you see the subscapularis as a nice horizontal band, the dark structure just deep to the subscapularis will be the middle glenohumeral ligament. And when you follow it, you can follow it all the way deep to it as it goes all the way to the humeral attachment lower down. Okay. Now, as you get below, as you go below this here, you start to get into the inferior capsule. And this inferior capsule is essentially your inferior glenohumeral ligament. As you come posteriorly, this is the posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament. Then as you come to the midline, it tends to thin out a little bit. And then as you come more anteriorly, you have the anterior gleno inferior glenohumeral ligament. So anterior and posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament is uh, what you would see here. All right. I hope that's clear. Any other questions? Okay. So supraspinatus anterior, mid and posterior exact division any. Now I, I don't, you know, normally we just go with, uh, with, you know, just dividing into the three bits. So I like using the sagittal images to look at this and you'll get this in a little bit more detail on the talk when Malini gives it to you next week on the, the rotator cuff. But essentially what I try to do is I try to get, you know, I try to look at this. If you look at this, this is your infraspinatus muscle. Um, this is your supraspinatus muscle. As this fans out, essentially this portion of the tendon is going to be the supraspinatus tendon. But as you can see, and as with the recent work that a lot of people have done, you can see that the infraspinatus actually comes a lot more anterior that one, than one expects it to. So the supraspinatus is actually a very small part of this anterior footprint, and the infraspinatus is a larger portion of this footprint. But essentially, you know, this sort of section right around here where, where I'm getting to the critical zone and maybe a little more distal to it, that's when I start to look at this. I would say that this is sort of the anterior most aspect of the cuff. Um, I can trace back here and I can say this area here is where the infraspinatus would end. So this is where the infraspinatus is. And then this portion here would essentially be that two centimeter section of the supraspinatus footprint. And then you could divide it if you wanted it into the, you know, with two lines into the anterior third, the mid third and the posterior third. So I hope that sort of helps you with understanding that. Okay. If there are no more questions, then what I'll do is I'll try and uh, move over to the section where we look at a few cases. So I have a couple of different cases for you. Okay. So I'll start out with uh, this case. Um, so if we look at this case here, we start to look for bone marrow edema. And what we notice is that there is not a lot of bone marrow edema. Now, as we realize that there's no bone marrow edema, we move over to looking at the rotator cuff. You can see this is the supraspinatus anteriorly. You can see how it's got nice dark signal here. And as we move a little bit more posteriorly, you can see how the signal has gotten bright. If I were to use my sagittal image here, sorry. You can see that where I'm pointing to is actually, if this is the supraspinatus here, this is the infraspinatus, the area of tendinosis is along the posterior supra and anterior infraspinatus. Okay, so that to me is my first clue when I'm looking at this case that I could potentially be dealing with somebody who's got an internal impingement. Okay, the rest of the rotator cuff looks okay. The next thing that I turn my eyes towards is to look at the biceps itself. And you can see here quite nicely, this is a fl slightly flattened biceps tendon, but otherwise relatively okay. You can see from the coracoid process, the coracohumeral ligament, and you can see a small, nice superior glenohumeral ligament. So this biceps is not really looking that bad. On these sagittal images, it also looks good. As I look at the superior labrum here, which is the next structure that I want to look at, I realize that there's cartilage going up all the way, and there's not a solid fluid signal cleft over here. So I'm not super convinced that there's a tear. 
um, I start to look at my posterior labral lesions uh, images on the axial images. And here, I'm not sure if it's clear to you, but you can see that there is a subtle tear here. I'm going to see if this sequence shows it to be better. But you can see here on this labral sequence that we do, which is a slightly more detailed sequence, how this anterior labrum is nicely blending with this anterior thing. And here you can see this proper labral cleft here, which is a nice uh, example of a posterior labral tear. If we were to scroll down a little bit more and up, we're not, it's not like a convincing posterior glenoid remodeling, but there's certainly a tear. So we have a posterior superior quadrant labral tear. We have posterior supra and anterior infraspinatus tendinosis. And then if I want to sort of clinch this deal, I come from anterior to posterior. And you can see here this green line. This is now more anterior. And as I'm coming more posteriorly here, I start to look at this posterior capsule. And I can see that there's a marked amount of inferior, posterior inferior capsular thickening. So when I see posterior cuff tendinosis, posterior superior labral tear, and posterior inferior capsular thickening, Together, I'm starting to think this is a case of posterior internal rotation deficit. I add into it the fact that I know this guy's pretty muscular. I see that there's not a lot of subcutaneous fat. Uh, he's probably a guy who's fairly gym going. And then this would be sort of consistent with either somebody who's a bench presser or a thrower. Um, and this is a classic example of posterior instability, posterior internal rotation deficit, or internal impingement, whichever you want to look at it. Okay. All right. Any questions about that case? Okay. Well, let's go to the next case. Okay, this is the next case I'm going to show you. So here again, we have a case. Um, we're looking at this. As we start to look at this case, the first thing that sort of um, strikes me is that there's no fracture. But I get this sort of haziness around this entire joint. You see this bright signal along the capsule down here, up here. And this is all stuff that makes me start to think that there's diffuse capsular edema. See this rotator interval with this massive capsular edema here. Um, and I just to give you a just, you know, that the case that we last saw and just to show you the comparison again. This was the first case that we saw. You can see all the structures here. This is the second case that we're looking at here. And you can see while you've labeled all the structures, see how that coracohumeral ligament that here is so thin is all thick and bulky. The superior glenohumeral ligament that's nice and thin here is all thick and bulky. This is classic rotator interval uh, edema. If you look at the coronal images through this area, you can see there's all this hazy signal within this area. And this is pretty classic for rotator interval scarring with edema. And then when you look at this inferior capsule here, it's also thickened and edematous. And those things together would tell me that this is probably a case of primary adhesive capsulitis. Now, in addition to that, if I find a little bit of rotator cuff tendinosis, if I find you know, a, a small little labral lesion, a little bit of posterior superior labral fraying, um, you know, here's the middle glenohumeral humeral ligament looking like sort of thin here, but I don't see anything else as such. So all these things together, would uh, favor somebody who's got a primary adhesive capsulitis, probably mid-stage inflammatory, given the amount of scarring and edema that we have here. Okay, all right. Okay, the next case I was gonna show you is this one. So this is a case where, again, you can see here, We look at the supraspinatus, you can see that there's tendinosis in the supraspinatus. As you go a little further back, the tendinosis is greater. So now if I look at the sagittal image here, I come here and I can see this is the anti, this is the bicep tendon. As I come here, this is the anterior supraspinatus. I can see that the tendinosis is more in the posterior supra and anterior infraspinatus. So again, my antennae go up in terms of an internal derange, in terms of internal uh, or internal rotation deficit or internal impingement. You can see here this superior labrum looking quite frayed. Uh, just to give you an example here again, you can see how this superior labrum looks quite frayed. That same dark triangle is not there, right? And as you look, as you go a little bit more posterior, you can see there's a cleft, quite clear cleft here along this labral uh, lesion. 
If we look at these axial images here, you can see that this labrum is really frayed out and small. That proper triangular appearance doesn't come. And you can see here in both this, in the in both anteriorly or in posteriorly here, where this arrow is, um, and anteriorly here, where this arrow is, you can see that there is a labral tear. So there's a labral tear that involves the entire superior labrum, involves the posterior superior quadrant, and this posterior inferior quadrant, there's got a slender cleft here. It makes me wonder if there's a continuation of this tear here. As you look at the anterior inferior labrum, it, it's there, but it seems more diminutive. So it's probably worn out. So this is somebody who I would think has not only got an internal impingement, but probably has something that's getting closer towards the circumferential labral tear. And this is somebody who would have probably multidirectional instability or multidirectional in micro instability. If I just go and look at his inferior capsule also here, you can see there's a lot of th thickening of this inferior capsule. Um, you notice that a lot of that is sort of more uh, posterior um, and there is a little bit more anterior as well. So this is somebody who's got capsular thickening, a little bit of laxity of the capsule. As you can see, it's quite a capacious capsule. It's not a tight capsule that would be just right around here. And you've got this cuff tendinosis with this, with this large labral tear. And then this would be somebody with an element of multidirectional instability. Okay, so you know that's another one that I sort of wanted to show you. Um, let's look at one more case here. Okay, so this is another case here again where we can see this is the. This is somebody who's had an injury. You can see that this inferior capsule has torn from the humeral attachment and there's leaking of, you know, there's leaking of, of, of intra-articular fluid along the humeral shaft. So this patient has definitely had a capsular injury. Um, and this patient did have an acute injury. And when you follow this patient, really, it's, it's kind of a nice case to see um, because as you follow this, you can see that there's a very discrete labral tear. It's large sort of defect here in terms of a labral tear. You can see it tracking all the way down across the entire anterior labrum. As you come to the superior labrum, you can see this prominent cleft up here, indicating that it's crossing 12 o'clock. And you can see the tear here along this entire posterior labrum as well. And so this is almost a circumferential labral tear in somebody who's had uh, chronic uh, instability in a, and, and, a, and then a more superimposed acute injury, where in fact, in this case, you can see the biceps, the subscapularis here, but you can see the biceps is subluxed out of the groove and is sitting more medially in, in this location. The supraspinatus tendon is intact with a little bit of tendinosis. Um, and then uh, you have a little bit of edema in the posterior humeral head. So this is, I just wanted to show you a good example of a large circumferential labral tear involving almost the entire labrum. Um, now the last case that I have for you is this one. So again, this is a somewhat interesting case. Here we have, um, you know, we look at this humeral head, everything looks pretty fine. There's no major bone marrow edema. Um, we start to look a little bit more now. What I notice, what you want you to notice here is how there is this flattening of this humeral head here. See this part anteriorly? And we're going to look at uh, a comparison case. Let's just take uh, another case here. So this is the case that uh, we're looking at. This is a comparison case. And I'm gonna flip this horizontally so you're not confused. But if you see this humeral head here, see how this margin is smooth like this, but this one is depressed over here, right? So this is almost like a reverse Hill-Sachs lesion that's non-acute. And when you start to look at the labrum here, you can see this is the posterior labrum. But as you come down here more discreetly, you can see this labrum has really lifted off from the glenoid. And you can see the periosteum here is intact actually over it. And so this is a pulp sar, a posterior uh, osseous, uh, sorry, posterior version of the labrum with intact per periosteal version of the labrum. So you can see that as an example here. So I just wanted to show you some variations just like we talked about, and you can go back and listen to the talk on anterior instability, where you can see examples. If you literally just flip the images the other way around, 
you'd see similar examples of posterior labral lesions. So this is an example of somebody who had a posterior dislocation. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and, and, you know, we went through some of the cases last time, but let me do one more case here. Um, and this is case 15. So this is a patient who has had a labral reconstruction. So you can see the labrum here. You can see this anchor here. And what you notice here is, I mean, just <clears throat> these anchors are so on face. Like they're, they're not even, you know, anywhere posted. They're very on face anchors. They're not, so, you know, they've definitely reduced the arc of whatever they're supposed to do. But the other interesting thing that you notice here is you see this area of posterior uh, femoral, uh, humeral head subchondral cystic change and bone marrow edema. And you can imagine if this patient was to externally rotate, how this area would go and attack, be right in this area. And this is actually getting grated on by a slightly proud anchor. Um, and this is something that we see every now and then. And if you were to look very closely at these images themselves too, what you'll notice is there's not really much glenoid articular cartilage remaining. So if you look at articular cartilage up here, you can see this nice gray cartilage here and here which is not really there in the inferior glenoid. So, um, so this is sort of an interesting uh, example of post-operative case where you can see articular cartilage wear. So um, I think what I've tried to do today, and it's a slightly shorter class, and I was hoping for a little bit more interaction from everybody, um, is uh, uh, go through some of the things with, um, with the labral and biceps labral lesions. What um, I've tried to do um, is, and again, let me just reiterate for everybody, is we've talked about looking at the, you know, at the different sequences that we look at. We've talked about looking at the biceps, the superior labrum on these coronal images here. We've talked about looking at the anterior superior labrum on the axial images, remembering that there are, comp sorry, with the superior labrum, we wanted to remember that there are variations of superior labrum, which is the meniscoid labrum or a prominent uh, labral cleft. Um, and the way to differentiate between them somewhat in not necessarily the most accurate way is if there is articular cartilage running between the labral cleft and the underlying labrum, then it's more likely a developmental variant. Whereas if there's no articular cartilage, then it's more likely a tear. We looked at the anterior superior labrum and we remembered, we talked about the two major labral variants, the Buford complex and the, um, uh, where you have an absent anterior superior labrum and a thickened middle glenohumeral ligament. And we talked about the sublabral foramen, which is something that appears as a transient defect in the anterior labrum. Uh, we talked about posterior superior labral tears and posterior impingement as well as uh, posterior internal rotation deficit with the combination of posterior superior posterior supra and anterior infraspinatus tendinosis followed by the posterior superior quadrant labral tear followed by flattening of the long head of the biceps with some subluxation with possibly associated underlying humeral head bone marrow edema and finally, the evolution of labral tear of, of anterior supra and, supi, uh, and superior subscapularis tears, and as well as looking at the posterior inferior capsular thickening. We saw a case of rotator of, of adhesive capsulitis with the scarring in the rotator interval. Um, and, um, and then we saw some cases of posterior dislocation where you saw the reverse hill sacs lesion as well as the posterior labral lesions. Now let's see here. Can we see healing of labrum after repair? If yes, by when can we see it in MRI? This is an interesting question. We have a lot of people talking about healing of labrum. Um, it's a bunch of tissue that comes back and sticks back onto the onto the you know onto the glenoid. Um, I've not. We don't really do much imaging for healing of the labrum as to whether it's healed or not. Um, I think people mostly take a clinical call on how they take things forward. I know the tissues can look very variable. Um, and so I'm not sure when I would call something as saying, look, this labrum has healed based on looking at on an MRI. So the simple answer is I would not use an MRI to tell me, okay, the labrum has healed. Now you can go back to all your normal activity because we don't do that very often at all. Um, I think more often than not, we see people when they're saying, hey, we've done labral surgery and the patient is still symptomatic in some way, whether it is impingement, whether it is labral signs, whatever. Can you have another look at it and let me know if the labrum is retorn 
or if it looks intact or if there's another cause for the pathology. Okay, any more questions, concerns? Okay, so what is the recommended clinical position of the shoulder in MRI scan to best see the biceps labral complex? So we normally scan the patient's supine with the hand in neutral position, so with the thumb facing upwards, and so that the so that the gleno the 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 biceps bicepital groove is sort of facing forwards at that. That's what we normally uh, sort of scan it as, and then we look at the biceps labral junction on the sagittal as well as the coronal images. So that that is sort of what our our normal way is. We don't get into aber positions and all that other stuff. Normally, that's not something we found a need to do in most situations. We've of course had a few cases where we may, you know, a couple of cases here and there where somebody would have called and said, "Hey, listen, I'm very concerned on anti inferior labral lesion," and then we just cannot see it. And in which case, we'll just do a scan in an aber position, and the tear sometimes shows itself up, but sometimes it doesn't show up either. So position-wise, I don't change positions from normal for most of the scans that we do. Any more questions? Anything else you'd like to know? Um, the next session we will do is on um, on the uh, on the labrum. Uh, sorry, on on the rotator cuff, and that is what Malini would do. What I'd also suggest for people to do is to post questions and things that they have, because as we get towards the later portion of the course, what we're trying to do is plan for that last session where we have people having doubts, where we have other things, and we can try and bring everything together to give you a, a clearer understanding of, of what, um, you know, and, and clarify thoughts and things like that. So, Generally, what we are thinking that we do is we go through something that would be anterior instability. We go through something that would be the labrum uh, about, uh, uh, and the biceps labral complex. We go through something that talks to the rotator cuff. We go through something that talks to the acromioclavicular joints and other miscellaneous stuff. And then we follow that. How to differ between scarring and tear accurately on MRI? I, I'm not sure. In, it's very hard, to, to be honest, because, um, well, Scarring and tear is not very hard as such because with the tear, normally you see fluid signal intensity. Scar tends to be dark and black. So that's the simple answer if we're trying to differentiate between the two things. All right. Any more questions? Anything else? Any feedback on the session in general? Um, if you want any more clarifications, please let us know if you want us to go slower on something, faster on something, something that was not clear enough, something that we can clarify in greater detail in future. Um, you know, let us know and we'll try and put those things in. I think the course is built for all of you and we'd like you to sort of engage and, and ask so that we can make sure that you're getting what you want out of the course. Okay, so if there's Nothing else. Um, thank you, everyone. Happy Diwali and uh, Happy New Year and all the best. And hopefully we see you sometime soon at some conference or the other. <laughs> all right. Okay. Good night.